Welcome to our global webinar on ending pandemics. I'm Steve Gelster, founder of Freeland, and we are a co-host of today's event with the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand and Bangkok, which is where I'm standing right now. It's about 7 p.m. here. We're being technically produced by AsiaWorks. We're also being joined by many of our new uh, campaign partners and other special guests from around the world. In fact, why don't we go up to the screen here. We've got speakers and alliance members coming in from all over the place, uh, Latin America, Los Angeles, We've got the Far East, the United States, and Europe. Uh, I think Jane Seymour, actress and head of Open Hearts Foundation, probably got up the earliest there in LA at 5 a.m. Thank you very much, Jane. We'll be hearing from you later, along with some of the top experts in different fields that are gonna to talk to us about COVID-19 and where we can go next. So as of today, April 20th, 2020, there are about 2.4 million cases of coronavirus recorded around the world, about 165,000 deaths, and we're moving towards several trillion dollars worth of economic damage. I know we're all looking for better news. We wanna turn the corner on this, and I think we can all safely say we don't wanna go through this again. But to make sure we don't go through this again, we need to address the root causes of COVID-19. All theories about how COVID-19 started point to this virus jumping from a wild animal to a person, just like other zoonotic outbreaks before this. We're talking like HIV, uh, Ebola, MERS, bird flu, SARS, they all jumped from a wild animal to a person, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly through a domesticated animal or livestock. And experts tell us that the way in which this is happening more and more is due to the destruction of nature, specifically the rise in commercial wildlife trade and the destruction of wild habitat, oftentimes converting for industrial agriculture. It just takes one of these animals to be carrying a pathogen, some disease for which we have no immune response, and boom, we get a viral explosion like COVID-19. Which means that a vaccine for COVID-19 is not gonna necessarily work against the next virus. It's not gonna cure the next pandemic. It's not gonna stop it. What we need to do, we feel as an alliance, is flatten the commercial wildlife trade and expand wild habitat. If we can do that, we will dramatically reduce the risk of recurrent pandemics. That's exactly what our alliance and campaign is about. It's called End Pandemics. So far, we have 21 organizations that have come together to unite to make sure that we do not go through this again. We've got wildlife conservation groups, we've got climate change groups, but we also have businesses, technology, finance, health experts, even folks from uh, science, technology, and also uh, the entertainment and communication sectors. There's lots of great organizations and projects all over the world, but let's face it, we don't always work together. These projects are uh, lacking in resources and they're not united. So we are coming together. We're going to learn from each other, coordinate our projects, try to raise resources together, and become better by listening to each other and be more impactful in our efforts to protect and regenerate nature. You're gonna hear from some of our Alliance members and some special guests, as I said, who are chiming in from around the world. We want to share our plans with you. This is gonna be a huge global effort, so please take advantage of your Facebook Live tap in. Write us your questions, your suggestions. We will look at them and try to respond during this uh, live webinar. So here with us today, we've got representatives from different places. I first wanna go to uh, our special guest and Alliance uh, partner in our campaign, Sean Heinrich. Sean is a Emmy Award winning filmmaker, photographer, and storyteller who has helped campaign successfully for the protection of marine species, dozens of species. 
uh, before we go to Sean, who's coming in to us from Colorado, he's the head of Blue Sphere, we're going to show a very short video that he and his outfit co-produced, which gives a different perspective on this whole uh, pandemic, uh, that coming from the virus itself. Let's now go to the video. Dear humankind, thank you for being a super host. I never imagined I'd have the opportunity to jump to a species as abundant as you. Most viruses only get to know their original host animal. Many exist entirely in the humid understory of a remote rainforest. We viruses are kept in check by healthy environments with diverse and abundant wildlife. But when you rip forests apart and capture billions of animals to feed your insatiable appetite for flesh and false cures, you bring viruses like me out of our natural quarantines. You introduce us to new hosts, like you. A super host of eight billion individuals and counting. A walking, flying, swimming, human meat market. You make up a third of all mammals on Earth by weight. The animals you grow to feed yourselves outweigh all the wild mammals and birds on the planet. As you drive our natural wildlife hosts to extinction, you throw us life rafts bigger than the Titanic. Why wouldn't I jump? As sinister as I may seem, it is not in my interest to wipe out my hosts. We all need other life to thrive. So if this sickness in your bodies opens your eyes to the deeper sickness in our shared planet, it will be to all our benefit. But my big question to you is this, am I enough? If apocalyptic fires aren't enough, if vanishing glaciers aren't enough, if super hurricanes aren't enough, is the cold shadow I cast across the lives of you and your loved ones enough for you to finally confront the prospect of your own extinction? Only you, humankind, can choose to be the cure to the deeper sickness. Only you can choose to nurture the ancient oceans, forests, and grasslands that nurture you, to bring back the chorus of birds and monkeys to silent rainforests, and to make wise choices every day in what you consume and how you live. By protecting nature in all its wild and wonderful forms, you protect yourselves. As the earth stops to take a collective deep breath, you have a rare opportunity to reimagine and redefine a new future. So tell me, what future do you choose? Let's go to Sean Heinrich in Colorado. Sean, thanks for joining us and thanks for joining the Alliance and the Campaign. What have you got to say about what we're up against and what's next? Is there hope? Yeah, good morning, Steve. And um, that's a great question. There's probably never before in history been a time where we as a global community have felt so connected and we wouldn't have probably chosen this way to feel connected. We are all feeling how quickly and how rapidly the consequences of our actions can affect not just our, our local communities or just our regions, but people on the other side of the planet with just an, within a week. So we're learning that things we do today don't just have consequences for future generations. They're affecting us right now. They're affecting our children. I have two children who are sheltering at home. Would I have ever imagined in my life that this would happen so quickly? Probably not, even though in my work, I've been on the front lines, I've seen a lot of dark things, and I've imagined that, yeah, when we destroy the climate, when we destroy nature, we destroy our air, that things will change. But I think things are changing faster than we've ever imagined. And it's up to us now to really give this a hard look. And there's a lot of debate at times out there about what are the origins of issues such as this. But I think this time we have a pretty darn clear path. It's the extraction of these animals out of these wild places, the loss of our wild habitats, and then taking these animals and cramming them together in these markets in conditions that we would never imagine for ourselves or something we cared about. And I've been in these markets and they are the places of nightmares. They really are. And it's, this isn't about finger pointing. This is just about reality. When you have 
species from all over the planet that never ever should have come in contact with each other, held in conditions that are beyond appalling. They really are horrific. What happens is their immune systems get compromised. And so you have these animals in highly compromised immune situations, dripping all kinds of bodily fluids on each other because they're stacked and crammed in such tight conditions. You create the perfect Petri dish. It's a place where viruses are trained to grow and eventually one jumps. And if it doesn't make it, the next one does and the next one. And eventually what happens is you have a scenario where the best, most hardy, most transferable virus survives. And in these very same places, you have humans coming in contact every single day, not dozens, but thousands and thousands of humans coming in contact with these immune compromised animals. So what is gonna happen? Exactly what happened now. And will it happen again? If we keep doing what we're doing, absolutely. It's not an if, it's just a when. And instead of waiting 100 years for the first one to happen and then 15 for the second, it'll happen in a year or two or three, we don't know. But it's within our hands. And, and from a terms of consequences, I look at the numbers and in just a few short months, we're looking at trillions of dollars lost on the global scale. We're looking at billions of lives affected. Countries, I can't think of a country right now that hasn't been touched. We're talking about millions of people sick. Just within a few short months, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of deaths. How much does it take for us to really wake up to this issue? And you know, we could move to finger pointing and that may make us feel good in the moment, but that's not gonna solve the issue. This is not just a China issue or just a them issue. These markets exist throughout Southeast Asia, West Africa, and Central America. So it may happen in China the first time or the second time, but it could happen anywhere. This is a global issue. And I would say, if we wanna talk about cultural issues, this has become an everybody issue. When you affect billions of people in a very short time, Nobody has the right to say, this is our business. It's now become everybody's business. And it should be. We have, as custodians of this planet, we have a responsibility. And in my work, I think the, the opportunity here is storytelling. To tell people a, not only what is happening, because yes, we wanna shine a spotlight on the issue, but I think it's really important to realize that we're in a time right now people, where the vast majority of the globe is gripped in fear. And what drives that fear? In my mind, I think there's two primary ingredients. The first ingredient is uncertainty. Nobody knows how to stop this right this moment and when or if things will go back to normal. And the second part of it is a sense of powerlessness. What, is I, what can I, as a citizen of this planet, what can I do about it? How can I change this situation for myself, for my children, for my community, and for the future? And so when I look at what we're talking about right now, we have it within our hands. We know the origins. And whether it be an animal that came out of a lab or whether it be a cannibal that came out of a, a, a um, market, it doesn't really matter. It's wildlife coming in contact in very close conditions with humans and other species and creating a perfect jumping point. We have it within our hands right this moment to change the course of history and prevent, prevent pandemics. And how do we do that? We shut down those markets. And we don't just do it on, with, without conscious. We have to look at these issues on a comprehensive level. We have to consider livelihoods. We have to consider communities. We have to look at what does it take to build transitions for people just like any other unsustainable industry. We're not going here to attack subsistence livers, living people who are in jungles, who are trying to feed themselves and their families. We're talking about commercial exploitation. And my ask is I think, let's not get distracted by all the tangents because we've done that in the past. And how did we end up here? By doing exactly that. In, in 2003, when we were looking at SARS and I was traveling through Asia during that time, we got our shot across the bow. We had our moment to see what the future might hold on a much larger scale, and we missed it. We got distracted with our daily lives. We got distracted with the economics. We got distracted with a lot of things. And as a result, we ended up exactly where we are today. My fear is, if we have a virus of this level of contagion, but with a much more significant death rate, we're not looking at a major blip, we're looking at a complete shutdown. We're looking about something that would not be recoverable. And I think we are going to recover from this. I have hope. I believe that the community, the global community has seen what can happen. I believe that for my children and for all of the children and people who are watching, I don't think anybody wants to accept in a future 
where our children walk around with masks on their faces, where every few years we have a rolling shutdown of the entire planet, where social distancing becomes the norm and so you no longer have touch and connection in society in a way that we desperately need it. I don't think anybody wants that. And so as a duty to ourselves, as a duty to the, our children and to future generations, I think we have an obligation to take this issue head on in a comprehensive manner, looking at the health issues, looking at the economic issues. But in this case, let's go right to the source and the cure, which is let's look at where it came from and how we prevent it. And in my mind, we have to go straight to our exploitation, our commercial exploitation of wildlife and support the groups, support the governments and support the institutions that want to change that and want to change that right now. Sean, thanks so much. As usual, you pack so many good points and passion into such a short time. You are one of the preeminent storytellers on this issue. I'm so happy to be working with you, and I'm glad that we're partners in this alliance and this new campaign. Uh, Sean, please stick with us, because I'm sure there's going to be questions for you later. Let's now move across from Colorado a little over to another part of the globe in, in uh, southern England to Andrew Mitchell the founder of the Natural Capital Alliance and the CEO of Equibri Equilibrium Futures. Uh, Andrew, tell us a little bit about the economic impact of COVID-19 and uh, what's the future look like? Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Sean, for great stories. Um, my perspective on this is going to be a little bit different around it because I think a lot of this is to do with the movement of money. Uh, I'm a zoologist. I've spent 40 years working in tropical forests around the world, the front line of conservation. But I work mostly now with the finance sector. And why? Because I firmly believe that unless we change the movement of money, we will continue to finance ourselves to extinction. And the reason for that is there's a disconnect between ourselves and our money. You put your money in the bank and you take the money out, but you never ask a question what the bank is doing with your money. You might have a pension fund, and you don't really ask what that pension fund is invested in. You hope it'll pay out later in your life. And the kind of problem we're facing now is that there's not much point in having a pension fund, which, when it pays out, you can't breathe the air, or you have a destroyed planet. What's the point in that? But the trustees who run those funds have no duty of care over what our planet should look like. They only have a duty of care to make sure you've got plenty of money to live on. So this is a fundamental thing that uh, we uh, need to come to terms with. And I've been trying to get the financial sector to pay attention to this for many years now. And in the case of biodiversity risk, uh, well, most of them say, ah, biodiversity is not very big. It's, uh, it's just to do with agriculture. And we're not really going to pay attention. Guess why? Because we're, we're focusing on climate right now. And climate risk is something that just in the last few years they've begun to wake up to. It's taken a long time, probably 10 years at least, but they're beginning to wake up to climate risk. Guess why? Because big assets they have in their funds are suddenly cratering and becoming valueless, such as the coal industry, for instance, which in America and Europe has, has, has cratered, in other countries not so much, uh, but value billions of dollars are being lost, and they worry about that. Renewable energy is now uh, cheaper than coal energy. So we're beginning a shift in assets. So people are waking up. Biodiversity risk? Nah. For 18 months, I've been talking about this since the World Economic Forum a year ago, trying to say biodiversity risk can be bigger, hit you faster, and it's due to the degradation of nature that you are financing. Well, they didn't pay attention, but they're paying attention now. The bill is going to be something like $10 trillion around the world. That's the money that the governments and the finance sector are having to pump into the economy to cope with COVID-19. Wow. What they don't get is how that is connected to nature, which is why this webinar is so important. Uh, you've already heard from what Sean has said. that it is probably wildlife markets. Uh, and the evidence for that is quite compelling. Zoonoses are pathogens that live in animals quite happily, don't cause a problem with the animals too much, and very rarely jump to humans. The current COVID-19 disease caused by a virus, this is the seventh coronavirus to make that jump. SARS was another particularly affected one, but nothing like this one. And I thought for many, many years that sooner or later, big viruses like this are going to have a massive impact on the world. And I never believed it would happen so soon. 
the next one could be even bigger. So we need to pay attention to this. What happens? Bats carry these viruses. In this case, it seems that the, if you look at the genome of the virus in us, it's very close to that of a pangolin and indeed to bats, in fact, horseshoe bats, which are commonly found in China, indeed all around the world. Somehow it seems to have jumped into a pangolin and been refined. And the pangolin genome has a wonderful ability to bind with human cells. And that's why the virus is so effective. It's gone through pangolins from bats, been refined, and it's got into humans. And then it goes around the world because of everything that's been said before so beautifully in that video. Now, the impact financially is vast. I believe that we can use this uh, terrible pandemic to wake up the finance sector to its responsibilities in creating the conditions for this to occur. We've heard about the micro conditions. Yes, these are poor farmers who are trading things like pangolins into South Vietnam and China. Pangolins are very, I don't know if you, you probably know what a pangolin is these days. Most people didn't. It rolls up in a ball. It's got armored scales. You can put 20 of them in a box and move them over to China real easy. But because they get mixed up with all these other animals, they get sick and uh, on the journeys, that's where you get this hothouse uh, of the virus. These are giant wildlife markets, but they're just like, you know, we, we shouldn't be too hasty in shutting them down because a lot of people depend on them for their livelihoods. It's just the wildlife park of these markets that sell fish, vegetables, all kinds of stuff uh, that is the problem and the appalling practices go on there. That's what we've got to nail. But br going out from there, we've got to nail the financial money that's going into unsustainable agriculture driven by higher populations. So what you get is deforestation in the tropics that has really been the ultimate driver of this terrible uh, pandemic. Because what happens is you get uh, overpopulation, you need more land, you've got to grow crops, you pump in the money, the deforestation occurs, the forest gets rolled back, and what happens? You get loads of pangolins that are there, lots of other exotic animals, civet cats, monkeys, all of these kinds of things suddenly become easy to get. The cities get richer, they get sold into exotic wildlife markets, pay a lot of money for them, and boom, the wildlife tracking guys come along, the illegal wildlife trackers and traders, they find them and they trade them into China. So it's another addition. Over 10 years, 100,000 pangolins a year have been going in, but it's the bigger process that creates that. So what I say is that uh, we should look at environmental crime. This uh, Refinitiv produced a report saying that's between 15 to 23 billion a year is wildlife crime. That's focused very much on what we've been talking about. Europol estimates it could be as high as 90 to uh, 260 billion if you include illegal fishing and uh, logging, illegal logging. And then the World Bank estimates that if you look at the impacts of those illegal that environmental crime and the loss of services that we all depend on, ecosystem services, it could be as big as one to two trillion that it's costing us all. So we go look at the movement of money. We can use this uh, pandemic as a way to fundamentally change, and that's your money and mine. We all have to think about how we spend our money and start asking questions about that. And that will filter down to the finer action that we must take which is focused on the wildlife markets themselves. Andrew, thanks so much for uh, joining this program and giving some advice to our alliance and campaign. Really appreciate it. Please stick around because there's already some questions coming in over the internet. One's got your name on it. I'm amazed at the price tag that you listed before. I'd like to come back myself and ask about that. Thank you very much and please, please stick with us. Let's now move down from Southern England into Switzerland where we're gonna to speak to John Scanlon. John is the former Secretary General of the UN body that regulates wildlife trade called CITES. John is now with African Parks. Uh, John, uh, let's hear from you. you. You testified before the US Congress just like a few days ago and mem mesmerized people. We'd love, this audience would love to hear from you on your perspective. Great, thanks very much, Steve, and thanks for the opportunity to join today's uh, discussion. Uh, as has been said, uh, a wet market in Wuhan, China, may be the origin of the outbreak of COVID-19. And wet markets exist not only in Asia, but in Africa and Latin America, and depending how you decide to define them uh, worldwide. Trade in wildlife, both legal and illegal, affects every country in one way or another. And avoiding future wildlife-related pandemics involves challenging 
global interconnected issues and a collective issue is needed to address them. Now, there are a number of actions that I believe could be taken to avert the next wildlife related pandemic. And Steve, you just mentioned the testimony I gave last week and uh, that's available. But in the time I have available to myself today, I'll just highlight a few of them. Uh, we firstly need some definitions around what we mean by a wet market and wildlife trade so that we can focus our efforts on areas of risk and avoid any unintended consequences. And I think this is what Andrew was referring to. Wet markets, wildlife trade and consumption that do pose a high risk to human health should be banned immediately as a precautionary measure. And there are experts in the field who are best placed to determine what activities pose a risk to human health. But at present, decisions to ban high risk activities can only be taken at the national level. Yet they can affect all of us. And to be effective, any current or future bans or closures of wet markets or any further restrictions on wildlife trade and consumption will need to be applied and enforced across all countries to stave off future pandemics. There is, however, no international legal agreement that enables wildlife markets, trade or consumption to be banned on public health grounds. International trade in wildlife is regulated through a convention known as CITES. As you said, I was Secretary General for eight years of CITES. But that trade is regulated to avoid overexploitation based on agreed biological and trade criteria. It does not take public health issues into account in its decision making. Now, we've known for some time now that serious wildlife crime is organized, it's transnational, it's fueled by corruption, has a devastating impact on wildlife, local communities, national economies, security, public health, and entire ecosystems. But that's, this is now increasingly obvious. And Andrew just gave us some of the numbers around illegal trade in wildlife and wildlife crime more generally, and I won't repeat them. With new national and hopefully international laws being enacted to ban high risk wet markets and the trade in and consumption of certain wildlife on public health grounds, the need for a coordinated global and national enforcement response is greater than ever. If not, such markets and trade may simply move underground, which will exacerbate rather than diminish the health risk. Yet remarkably, there is no global legal agreement on wildlife crime. Now, the reality is that the international regime for regulating wildlife trade, combating illegal trade and wildlife crime more generally is inadequate. Now, the current pandemic illustrates the point. COVID-19 is thought to have originated in horseshoe bats with other wild animals, possibly pangolins, playing a role in their transmission to humans. The horseshoe bat is not listed under CITES and hence international trade is not regulated. Pangolins are listed under CITES and commercial trade is prohibited. Yet from 2016 to 2019, we saw a record number of pangolin scales seized and confiscated. Profound changes are needed to the current legal framework if we are to have any hope of preventing the next wildlife related pandemic. Firstly, we need to incorporate public health risk into the international framework for regulating wildlife trade. Now, this could be achieved by amending CITES to include public health into its mandate, including to deal with domestic markets, commercial and non-commercial trade and consumption, or by developing a new agreement, possibly under the WHO. Secondly, we must treat wildlife crime as a serious crime and embed it in the international criminal law framework. Now, we can do this by bringing wildlife crime under the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime through a new protocol, as has been done for other serious crimes, such as human trafficking. What we need is a legal agreement that obliges countries to criminalize importing any illegally sourced wildlife, such as we see in the US under the Lacey Act, and to oblige serious wildlife crimes to be criminalized, including those that carry a serious health risk. Now, to be as effective as possible, a scaled up global and national enforcement effort will need to be complemented by many other actions including well-targeted demand reduction campaigns, initiatives to provide alternative sources of protein and livelihoods to people who are severely affected by any bans, taking measures to better protect wildlife at its source and its habitat, because it's best protecting its source before it ever enters any illegal trade, as well as tapping into new sources of funding 
Now we know the benefits of nature conservation extend well beyond wildlife to include health benefits, security benefits and development benefits. And we need to tap into these sources of funding. Unilateral actions at the national level are welcome, but they're not enough. The implications of decisions and actions taken on high risk activities have global implications and must be brought into an open and transparent international process. We must institutionalize the changes that are needed by embedding them into the international framework of laws, funding and programs to ensure transparency and accountability in taking as well as implementing critical decisions on high risk activities. If we do not, then I fear we may soon find ourselves back in the same place as we are today. Thank you, Steve, for the invitation to share some of these thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And the recent talks have generated lots of questions, so we'll get to the Q&A in a little bit. Appreciate your comments, John. Uh, I know in an Alliance campaign call the other night, Sean Heinrich uh, mentioned we should even have a UN inspection agency similar to one that goes around and makes sure that there's no nuclear bombs or biowarfare uh, uh, weapons being made, you know, given what's happened in these wet markets. Appreciate your comments about the, the health uh, implications and how we need to uh, link that also to considerations on wildlife trade. Thank you for your advice on our campaign and our alliance. And just to let people know, as we are trying to phase out commercial wildlife trade, but we are not talking about infringing on indigenous people's subsistence, hunting rights, etc. So we can come back and talk about that later. Uh, let's now move from Switzerland all the way down into South America to uh, Brazil to talk to Dr. Juliana Machado Ferreira from Freeland, Brazil, uh, one of my colleagues. We often hear about illegal wildlife trade and poaching, and we tend to think about Africa and Asia. I think Juliana's at the front line there and has been uh, following illegal trade and poaching issues in that region. Juliana, give us your perspective. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, I think that the first thing I would like to say is that for us to minimize the risks of a next pandemic, we have to bear in mind that we have to let go, let go of habits, get out of our comfort zones, and letting go of what seems to be profitable industries. Researchers and activists have for years, I know I have for 15 years, talked about the risk of zoonosis um, related to wildlife exploitation and we're not taken seriously enough. Well, now the world knows how serious it can get. Uh, in South America and for example, in Brazil, I would like just to cite that in Brazil, uh, wildlife crime is considered a lesser crime, not a full crime, not a serious crime. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, I advise discretion. If viewers are not comfortable with strong images, please look away for, for a few minutes. Um, here, just one second. Can you see my, my slide here? Uh, I see, so in- I still see you, Juliana. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. It's okay. So, yeah, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, um, we've got technical difficulties. Uh, oh, here we go. It's on the screen now, Juliana. Okay. Go for it. Okay. So in South America, and especially in Brazil, uh, there is wild consumption, uh, trade, and exploitation of wildlife, both for domestic markets as well as for export. And I mean commercial. I, I'm not talking about subsistence, okay? So seizures of illegal bushmeat of paca, guti, tapirs, deers, armadillos, native peccaries and others add up to several tons per month throughout Brazil. In the Amazon alone, data from the federal police, uh, data from federal law enforcement agencies indicate seizures of more than 16,000 eggs and 10,000 freshwater turtles for consumption between 2012 and 20, part of 2019. In Brazil, between 2011 and 2015, there were seizures of almost 70 tons of illegal or of questionable origin shark fin. Just in 2019, approx approximately 32,000 ornamental fish. In the past six years, hundreds of jaguars may have been killed, not only by cattle ranchers and hunters, but also to supply the demand for teeth and jaguar paste in Asia. Just in the state of Sao Paulo, in green there, 
alone, over 30,000 wild animals, mostly birds, have been seized per year for the past 10 to 15 years just by a single law enforcement agency. But the wild pet consumer market exists all over Brazil and South America, both for the domestic as well as for domestic markets as well as for exports, and targets several species. There are about 4 million legal songbirds registered at non-commercial breeders from wild species, out of which 3 million are suspected to have been poached or laundered. And the dangers are not unknown. A 2018 study analyzed armadillos from the state of Pará and found that over 60% were contaminated with the causative agent of Hansen's disease or leprosy. Brazil happens to be the second country in the world uh, with most cases of leprosy. Reptiles can carry salmonella, birds can carry chlamydia, which causes ornithosis, but also herpes virus, burnavirus, and circovirus, among others. Rodents can, carry le um, can cause leptospirosis, hantavirosis, mammals can carry rabies, and so on, and so on, and so on. However, the diseases, let me see if I can stop sharing here. Uh, the diseases that we know are not the main issue. Just give me one second. Okay. The main issue are the diseases that we do not know, uh, the new ones that can jump for, to humans just as the new coronavirus. So Freeland Brazil, at Freeland Brazil, we were combating wildlife trafficking through uh, demand reduction, uh, support to counter wildlife trafficking governmental agencies and public policy. Uh, we are now conducting a project in collaboration with WWF Brazil and funded by the US Department of State aimed at combating wildlife trafficking in Brazil uh, through strengthening the legal framework, building capacity, and transnational coordinating for combating wildlife trafficking. And the reason why we think that joining this campaign is crucial is because we truly believe that uh, this commercial trade in wildlife needs to end, and we cannot do it alone. No one organization can do it alone. Furthermore, the multifaceted approach that is being proposed, which encompasses, yes, phasing out commercial trade in wildlife, but also alternative livelihoods for communities and restoration and conservation of ecosystems is crucial, especially for a country like Brazil, where these items are not in the governmental agenda. As a matter of fact, now that we are trying to survive COVID-19, that we are fighting this pandemic, deforestation, invasions of indigenous lands, and illegal mining have gone out of control in the Amazon without governmental response. But I trust that this global alliance will pave the way for us to fight this, conserve healthy ecosystems, wildlife in the wild, as well as human well-being and economies. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana, who combines, she's a scientist, a PhD, but she's also a frontline enforcement supporter. Good to hear from you. We've got some questions coming in specifically about the Amazon in South America, so please hang with us. Let's now uh, go back into the United States where we are gonna speak to Louis Sahoyos. Louis is the head of the Oceanic Preservation Society. Uh, we often hear about terrestrial animals, but there's a lot of poaching and trafficking on the high seas too. And Louis, uh, you might remember the movie, The Cove. Louis is an Academy Award winner. He was the director of The Cove. Uh, Louis, please talk to us about the implications of COVID-19 uh, for the Marine and, and all your other uh, viewpoints I know that you have uh, on our alliance and what you think we need to do going forward. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, leave off the, the ocean, even though it's really important for, to me right now. Um, I want to put a little bit finer point on this. I've been to the wildlife markets in China with, with Sean, and that's, that's in our movie, Racing Extinction. But uh, I want to address a bit of the elephant in the room right here that we haven't talked about is that the reason that pangolins and bats are together in these markets is for traditional Chinese medicine. It's a small faction of Chinese traditional medicine, but it's a fairly large one because of the amount of people doing it. The bats are in the market. The bats have been implicated, as was mentioned, like in a half a dozen of the most recent um, pandemics and epidemics. You know, uh, MERS, SARS, Ebola, uh, you know, uh, 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 recently COVID. But, you know, the question that I think we should all be asking ourselves, like, why are bats such a, a prevalent suspect here? And that's because that they're actually used in Chinese traditional medicine. Um, 
there's a thought in China, it's called Zhenbu, that if you take the, the qualities of the animal that you're eating, it's somehow going to give you the properties of that animal. So a bat can see at night. So in tr traditional Chinese medicine, they actually use bats. They eat bats and bat feces in the belief that it's going to cure night vision, glycoma, uh, your, your, your eyesight. You know, so I would love to get rid of, you know, all the, all the animals out of the live markets. It's, it's horrible. But with, there's several hundred viruses that a bat has. It's not, it doesn't harm the bat itself. But when you put them in, into the market, it's very, they very easily jump to pangolins and these other you know, endangered species and maybe not so endangered species that are, that are in the market. So I think it's, if we're going to stop this, the, the COVID viruses, from uh, you know, affecting all of us, China, I'm sorry, China has to address the elephant in the room. Get bats out of the market. Get, uh, get <laughs> bat feces. No, I want you to read. There's a, there's a paper I just read that, was, that came out of China. It says, fecal medicines used in traditional medicine, uh, medical system of China, a systematic review of their names and original species. That's the, this is the title of the paper, traditional uses of and modern investigation. So they're investigating fecal uses of medicine historically in China. It says, during the long struggle against diseases, ancient Chinese doctors found that some unexpected materials such as human or animal feces could effectively treat diseases. These fecal medicines may be a valuable gift from China's traditional medicine to the world and has potential drug candidates for the treatment of some chronic diseases because of their, their low side effects. Now, in this case, the side effects of somebody eating, you know, bat feces in China is now affecting everybody in the world. So at the very minimum, let's get bats and bat feces out of Chinese traditional medicine because that's why, that's why we're here. You know, it's, 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 yes, it's because of civet cats, possibly, and, and pangolins, but get rid of this batshit crazy idea that eating bat feces or bats is good for your vision. There's somebody in China has to be addressing this. Otherwise, this is going to happen again because these bats are in the market. You know, they're with a lot of those other animals, but bare minimum, get rid of bats out of the markets. And now, again, I would love to see all, the, you know, all seafood. I'm, you know, Three quarters of all pandemics around the world are caused by the eating of animals. So if you really want to get rid of, you know, all of them, the whole elephant in the room, it's caused by the eating of all animals, poultry, chickens, pigs, you know, the swine flus and the bird flus, same kind of things going on. You know, as long as we're eating animals uh, and putting them in these, you know, in America, we have the CAFOs, the confined uh, feeding operations. And I've been to those. And they're just absolutely horrible. You know, the slaughterhouses, that's why I went uh, I a vegetarian in 1986. I went to a slaughterhouse. And there's, a, there's a good reason that people say if slaughterhouses had glass walls, there would be no slaughterhouses. Because if you saw what happens there, you would be pretty shocked. Even chickens, you know, the chickens, are, you know, they have millions of those under one roof. And you go in, you open up the door of a confined feeding operation, and these free-range chickens, it's actually just a, like a, a, a Walmart or a Costco, this place, big warehouses that seem to go on forever, and you get hit by the ammonia. Because these animals, these free-range animals, that just means that they not, might not be in cages, but there's you know, millions, hundreds of thousands of minimum, sometimes millions in a huge room, and the urine smell just makes it so you, you can't breathe. Now, these chickens live in that their entire life. They, they can't go outside. They can't go outside for a very good reason, because if they go outside and go to a pond, then influences come from ducks. All flus come from ducks or, or wild birds. And if a bird hops in the pond because of the chickens, then they're going to get infected. So you have to, if you want to eat animals at scale, you have to put them into these confined feeding operations and then feed them buckets and buckets and truckloads of antibiotics. Because they're diseased, they're, these are pe they're all petri dishes. The live markets, the CAFOs, the slaughterhouses—they're all petri dishes for the, these diseases. So you know we could put a fine tooth on, you know, fine comb tooth on it, and say, let's let's stop eating bats bare minimum. We'll get rid of like, these really deadly COVID voices, uh, uh, COVID diseases. But if you really, really want to stop pandemics for future generations, stop eating all animals poultry, beef, everything, because, there, you know, swine flu, swine flu killed between 150 and 575,000 people, affected about 
some people say up to 22% of the population. This is in 2009. You know, that came from eating pigs. You know, the, the, the bird flus of uh, the swine flus of, you know, they started the Spanish flu all throughout history. Those are for what, you know, the West is eating. So you really want to get rid of pandemics forever, you know, stop, you know, reduce, reducing our uh, animals in the markets and becoming more vegetarian or vegan is the way to go. You know, it's, it's a very ancient uh, technology to eat an animal. You're basically, all the protein that we're eating comes from plants. So you know, the, the middleman in all these sequences is, is, is the animal. Take the animal out of the equation, you get rid of pandemics forever. That's it. I'll get off my soapbox. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Uh, it's great to have you and the Oceanic Preservation Society in our alliance. Those who are watching can see we've got a, quite a diverse array of organizations and partners. Um, appreciate you bringing several elephants into the room there. And believe it or not, for those who are watching, we did not rehearse this before, but it works perfectly. We're now going to zip all the way over to the Far East to Taipei and hear from Jay Fang about uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, Jay is the head of the Green Consumer Foundation. Jay, what do you think about all this? Yeah, I heard a very good uh, statement from Louis. I think uh, uh, Taiwanese may maybe be misunderstand as part of China, but uh, we're quite different. Actually, back to 93, 94, we worked together with uh, Steve to bust about two tons of rhino home in Guangzhou. I think that that is a good case. And uh, then I learned uh, very different society in China. It's not uh, one homogeneous society. They are different. Ac actually, I <clears throat> intensively communicated with, with uh, a group of uh, Chinese doctors in China. There are about 120 members. They are elite uh, Chinese doctor, and they are genuine Chinese doctor. Uh, some of them, they are even uh, vegetarian, like uh, some of our friends. But I think now it's uh, uh, China make a law. It's make a very good for for our conservation act because they clear identify <coughs> few animals as edible or trade uh, can be traded. So other things will be uh, illegal, will be criminal. So we can divide it into uh, uh, no more business or com commerce mm -hmm. and uh, criminal. Like uh, we bust those rhino homes before. That was criminal. Now it's more clear. And uh, that's <clears throat> because this pandemic have a clear and loud sound to all Chinese and the Chinese medicine society or all the Eastern Medicine Society, even in Taipei, we have uh, uh, Eastern medicine stores, and they are all aware about this. I think it is a good chance for us. We can work with uh, good people. They are not all bad people. There are some bad people do the terrible thing, mm -hmm. brutal slaughtering. We all witness that. Mm -hmm. And now we think uh, this is a good chance for us to leverage and make a China, a Chinese genuine Chinese medicine doctor work with us to turn this around. And also, I think it's very important for the habitat. The, the habitat conservation is very important. Even in Taiwan, we, uh, our government still wants the industrial development, so we will destroy uh, 7,000 years uh, agar reach. Yeah. So I think that, that would be uh, destroy the habitat that will cause all the uh, disease come out. For example, uh, the, the birds, the wild birds, the migration, they will bring the influenza virus around the world. We can, we can take that. But if they are smuggling or uh, poaching and cause the, somebody eat those wildlife, cause the disease, we cannot tolerate that. We, so we have to differentiate the difference in between. Thank you. Jay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I just want to say, bless you, Jay. Jay, back uh, almost 25 years ago, helped us track down, when I was working with the Environmental Investigation Agency, 
uh, the world's largest rhino horn trafficking syndicate. And because of Jay, we were able to dismantle that syndicate, and I think that helped save some rhinos back then. I hear you, Jay. What you're saying is that there are some traditional Chinese medicine practitioners, folks in the industry, who feel that they're getting a bad name from a, a minority. Louis before said it only takes a minority of a huge population to have a negative impact. I'm glad to have both of you on this alliance, and um, it's going to be great working together on this campaign. So thanks for joining us from Taipei. Now let's go to, let's swing our, around the globe over to Portugal. At Lisbon, Portugal, we've got uh, Alan Lauch, who is the CEO of Generation Blue and also representing another partner in our alliance called Earth Pulse. We call Alan the banker for nature. He comes from the finance and banking uh, industry, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about the, the role of uh, blockchain and how to make nature protection more rewarding. Uh, over to you, Alan, up in uh, Portugal. Thank you, Steve, and hi, everybody. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well. I'm actually uh, uh, in southern Portugal, Al Jazeera, next to a nature reserve on a mobile connection, so uh, it might uh, be a bit spotty. Um, but um, I would, um, I'd love to share some of my views on uh, really the root cause of why we're destroying nature and why we're facing um, what is now going to be an era of planetary risks whether it's pandemics, climate change, uh, we've degraded nature to an incredible degree because we have an economic system that forgot about nature, right? Um, I remember a conversation with Paul Ehrlich from Stanford um, who uh, tells me that every economist he meets, he asks a question, um, does your model include Earth? Um, and uh, usually gets blank st stares um, and uh, then his response is maybe you should try another model. Um, right now, Earth gives us free ecosystem services that we use, um, that we derive value from, that are about $140 trillion a year uh, in an $85 trillion economy, right? All for free. Um, but uh, we have an economy um, which essentially incentivizes extraction, right? It values death. A forest is only worth uh, its value in timber. Uh, there's no value. There's no GDP. Uh, for a rainforest that's just biodiverse uh, and actually builds so much resilience, gives us so many ecosystem services, uh, watersheds, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's crazy, right? We're, we're basically, we, we have an economy uh, which is deriving value and incentivizing essentially extraction and valuing death. And therefore, it should not be a surprise uh, that we're actually facing um, uh, ecological disasters. So for us to reverse this, uh, we need to go to the root cause of this. Why are people trading wild animals? Money, right? It's bad money. Um, let's create opportunities for people to make money uh, regenerating, protecting Earth. Uh, and we can do that um, using technologies now that were not available uh, a while ago. So we um, founded uh, Earth Pulse. Um, Steve had a, a brilliant idea to um, come up with a methodology called MER, uh, Monitoring, Evaluation, and Rewards, Mother. And the, the whole idea is to create uh, a system which acts as a super brain, right? Where we can, if we're going to have a war room, we want to understand what's going on. Uh, well, we have, a, we have a nature room that needs to monitor what's going on to our ecosystems, what's uh, affecting the lungs of the earth, the biodiversity, uh, the coral reefs, uh, the sea grasses, for example that are so incredibly important for creating resilience, for actually fighting pandemics uh, as well, uh, we ought to be monitoring the health of all those different systems. Um, so that's the super brain. That was the internet though, that's not enough. We also need a, a super heart, right? And this is where blockchain comes in. Uh, blockchain technology, really this decentralized ledger, what it empowers is this internet of value, um, which is vastly greater than the internet of information. So if we look at the value creation that was created by the World Wide Web in the 90s uh, and 2000s, uh, what we're seeing now is something that is much more significant. It's a much larger scale. This internet of value is vast. And this internet of value um, ought to include activities which are regenerating, uh, regenerating nature. We're seeing um, carbon markets, for example, as the first outgrowth of that, but plagued with difficulties because of accounting, 
now we have satellite technologies that can, for example, verify and, and, uh, and uh, monitor soil carbon um, uh, for agricultural practices. So one of our Earth Pulse partners, Regen Network, is working with, uh, with uh, Regenerative Farm in Australia, um, basically using free satellite information to, to, to do what would have taken so much money uh, to do rainforest protection, right? Rainforests, which um, you know, harvest, which are 50% of the world's biodiversity and 5% of the world's surface. Um, we have monitoring, uh, uh, monitoring protocols developed by Regen already that simply detect uh, rates of deforestation and can incentivize and reward communities for protecting those areas. So if we make conservation rewarding, um, we have an opportunity to shift this. So think about the technologies that we have, this decentralized ledger, that's, which is incorruptible, which enables peer-to-peer -peer transfer of value, right? Um, uh, just the value of having a system like that is extraordinary. Every single year, um, banks earn payment fees of about $1.7 trillion. To put that in perspective, uh, that closes the gap for most of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, from climate change to poverty and so on. Creating systems that make that transfer of value um, more efficient um, and more resilient um, is an incredible opportunity. And creating new forms of money right now as well that are backing the good guys is going to be so important. Um, we heard about the, the great uh, destruction of value in our economy. The, the United States is, for example, already pledged a stimulus uh, program over 10% of GDP. So we will see 10 trillion plus um, in destruction of value. Um, and what that means is that we have a massive deflationary shock in our economy, right? Um, and we have this fractional reserve banking that actually depends on perpetual growth. People are now talking about modern monetary theory getting money directly to people, bailing out people, not just corporations. Well, how about bailing out people who are helping mother nature, right? Um, we have uh, Delta and Shannon Research in Australia has come up with a global carbon reward, which could en enable anyone in the world, any farmer, any, anyone who's protecting rainforests to earn these carbon rewards that could then be exchanged by any partners, central banks could be involved, but anyone could be involved, an individual investor could be involved in buying these credits. Um, you could have a business which simply accepts these credits as a partial means of payment to be part of it. Um, so the idea is to come up with a system where everyone can be a part of. And we call that system Earth Positive. It's a very, very simple idea. Let's leave Earth better than we found it. Let's take responsibility for our footprint. Let's have a handprint that's bigger than our footprint, right? The cost of doing that, the cost of this handprint that makes an act of consumption actually net positive or regenerative is far less than 1% of consumption. So imagine a world where every act of consumption is met with a greater act of regeneration. Every single purchase, for example, uh, triggers the protection of rainforests, of tiger habitat, and creates a more resilient um, and beautiful world for all of us. So to find out more, check out earthpulse.io. And um, again, thanks, Steve, for this opportunity to, uh, to share. Thank you, Alan. It's great to have your brilliant mind and passion as a member of our alliance and campaign. Thanks for reminding us that we need to be, you know, we need to reward the protectors of nature. And I think with your expertise in uh, technology and banking and the application of digital technologies and currencies, that that's going to be very helpful in our alliance to turn the corner. Uh, we'll be coming back to you, I'm sure, Alan. There's more questions coming in. We'll get to those in a second. Before we go to Jane Seymour out in Los Angeles, uh, we're going to play just a two-minute campaign video, which kind of summarizes where we're at right now and what the campaign looks like. Uh, can we go to that video? COVID-19 has changed our world. The way we live, our economy, our health system, everything. COVID will not be forgotten. To make sure that we never go through this again, we have to understand why it happened. 
COVID and other zoonotic outbreaks were transmitted to people from animals that were taken from or pushed out of their natural environment. SIV jumped from a primate to a human and then became HIV. SARS jumped from a civet being sold on a menu. Mares from a camel. Bird flu jumped from wild birds. Ebola from bats. There are countless other viruses in nature waiting to be unleashed if we don't change our relationship with nature. Experts agree, rising wildlife trade, industrial farming, and dwindling wildlife habitat have brought people into closer, unnatural contact with animals. Our campaign is taking aim at these root causes of pandemics to prevent them from recurring and harming us again. Working around the world, we are reducing demand for wildlife through consumer education and introducing bans on wildlife trade. Together, we are protecting wildlife populations inside their natural environments. We are stopping wildlife trade by enforcing laws and closing wildlife markets. We are training rangers and helping local communities and poachers transition to sustainable agricultural practices. A new medical cure for COVID-19 will not work against the next virus. Stimulus packages will amount to nothing more than expensive band-aids that need frequent changing if we do not address the root causes. Let's come together and prevent more outbreaks through wildlife and wild habitat protection, as if our lives and economies depend on it. So that gives a summary of our campaign I would like to now go out to Malibu, California with Jane Seymour from the Open Hearts Foundation, which I also know has been doing its bit to alleviate suffering from COVID sufferers, uh, victims. Jane, uh, what do you make of all this? Oh, Stephen, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm overwhelmed. Um, first of all, well done. Thank you for putting all of this together. We've just you know, got to get it to a wider audience because, you know, when I watch the ticker tape or I see what's on, on, on television, the real story isn't really being told. And you are telling the story here with this webinar. So um, I feel that as a communicator, as someone that can, you know, is not a scientist, is not an expert in any of these things, the one thing I can do is to find some way to let the general public understand, you know, why this really is and, and how it's really happened. And I mean, it is batshit crazy, literally. I mean, I heard someone mention leptospirosis. I've had it. I was in a rainforest and I got it from rodents. And I can tell you, I nearly died from lept leptospirosis. So um, there's, a, there's a, an amazing um, time that we're in right now. I think everyone has suddenly stopped and gone, wow, how could this happen? You know, we, we talk about saving animals and the planet and, you know, and, and, and everything seems a little bit green and, and, um, and undoable. But suddenly all of us, are, we're, we're, we're panicked. We're wearing masks. Our children are freaking out. They don't know what's going on. No one can hug. No one can go to school. No one can do anything. And, and we hear that it comes from the fecal matter of, 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 a, of a bat. I mean, it, it's just unbelievable. And... What you are doing and what everyone, all the experts are doing, we have to make sure that these amazing videos you're making, this incredible information, this dialogue, this dialogue between all the people is really seen in a wider way. And, and if there's anything that I can do to bring attention to that, that's what I'm here for. I am listening. I am learning. I am in awe of what you are doing. Um, you know, uh, too many people saw something on television recently about a man keeping tigers and, the, and that world. I mean, when you told me there were more tigers in Texas than there were in the world, in, in the wild, I just went, you can't, you can't be right. But, you know, it is absolutely 
stunning. It, it now matters to everyone. I, I think the, the, the um, financial impact of this, um, I think understanding what a, a wet market really is and, and how we can make a difference. And, you know, I, I'm not sure I really want to eat any more animals. Um, you've already got me there. But thank you for making this happen. And uh, whatever I can do to help you and all these amazing, extraordinary people bring it to the wider public, I'm, I'm on. I'm on your side. Thank you, Jane. And thanks again for getting up so early. You were the earliest bird for sure. And thanks for bringing up the important role of storytelling. Jane joined our film festival in Wisconsin last year. And, you know, we've got all these experts in different areas. Storytelling is part of the arsenal for sure. And when you speak up, people do listen. So we appreciate you, you uh, joining this effort with us. You're welcome. Speaking of storytelling, we have uh, the Global Environment Media Company, which is going to launch in September. And we're now going to swing over from Malibu down into uh, southern France and speak to Christian Moore, who's going to tell us more. And I think first, are we going to, we're going to see Christian's video and then hear some words from him about GEM. The Global Environment Media Platform invites communities interested by our global issues to share positive ideas, experiences, projects, and social and environmental solutions. GEM adopts a mixed media video-centric approach that provides the support of each piece of content with relevant data and information from NGOs, universities, and foundations globally. The platform covers nine topics, the ocean, forests, water, climate change, biodiversity, energy, food, people on earth, and sustainable living. GEM Television will be fully accessible, offering the latest video content covering all environmental topics. The channel will be distributed via satellite, cable, internet, and available on all devices. All video content, academic information, and infographics can be accessed simply with a social media login. Each piece of content can be shared through Facebook, Twitter, or several other communication platforms. The infographics section will contain a vast library of facts and figures relating to environmental and social information. The mixed media architecture approach allows these interactive graphics, visual charts, and animations to support the relevant topics. Through GEM's partnerships with renowned scientific organizations, the platform provides users access to millions of scientific research papers. GEM's University Classes section contains a comprehensive listing of environmental and social courses available on and offline. People are the solution to the world's environmental problems, so GEM will actively inspire participation to get involved, donate, as well as crowdfunding initiatives. To do more, Global Environment Movement Association is a non-profit set up and designed to provide the support needed for GEM by providing media coverage and distribution of content. Donating to GEMA will enable visibility through content creation and media exposure to build awareness through film, television, and social networking. Like Google is to search and NASA is to space, through positivity, inspiration, and education, GEM will be the hub for all environmental information and news. Christian, thanks for joining us. And I should have said before the video, but I think the audience can now figure out why we brought you here. Obviously, uh, teaming up with you and Jim is necessary because as people on the front line, policy, uh, fighting deforestation, poaching, but also from the health sector and everything, your Jim covers all those subject matters uh, and you're also making uh, all this media material available to the public. Tell us about uh, what you're launching in September and uh, more about this, um, this partnership. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you for having me here to, to, to relay this on. You know, uh, there hasn't been a day that's gone by for the last uh, year that we 
delving into this project, which was um, really to look at uh, consolidating all of the information that's out there from all of the efforts uh, put forward from agencies, NGOs, uh, foundations, uh, institutes, working towards the better good of trying to put information out there on the environment, the research and the work that it actually does. And coming from a media background and like-minded people in my, in my realm, we started to look at how easy was it to research information online and how, how could we get correct information on specific subjects. I heard earlier, you know, with children, uh, I have m multiple children and uh, they all wanted to go and look for information online and we could, couldn't find it so easily. So the idea was here to bring together with the support of big foundations and, and, and the aid of yourself, with all foundations to come together, to put together uh, a hub online, which is a platform with a media, uh, mixed media architecture approach, which allows us to bring all of the subject matters into the categories and be able to represent them, not only to get the message out as much as possible on all media forms, from a television channel, be launching in September as well, which will be on, as we said, on cable and satellite, as long as uh, uh, along with IPTV, but also a platform which will be used for educational purposes. So, with the support of all foundations and information coming into us, our team, which we're building with network executives and uh, specialists from all fields of the environment, is to really bring a um, an easy to use platform for information and be able to promote all of the efforts and works that are being done out there in all the topics that we've selected, which are in part driven by the United Nations and the issues that we're facing in the world today. Especially hearing about today's speakers and uh, the issue of uh, animal trading, this is something that has come up, I've, I've heard a few times, where it's information and getting this out there and really having people uh, understand what's going on and also looking at positive solutions and what are the solutions. We see a lot of information about what's wrong, but not a lot about how we can actually physically change it and create those dialogues. So this is what we aim to achieve with the GEM platform. And it seems that uh, we're, we're headstrong right now and uh, really looking forward to our launch in September. Fantastic, and I think that's where our minds meet. The Alliance is also very solution oriented. We wanna go beyond all this bad news and uh, fix this problem and make sure it doesn't happen again. And that means protecting and regenerating nature. And we're so glad that you're setting up a 24 seven channel and a hub that's gonna promote and show positive stories about solutions on how to protect our environment. So glad you're doing it. So thanks well, for being thank with you. us. Indeed, and it happens with all your help. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks for joining. Okay, we're gonna go to our questions and answers now. We've got lots of questions, but uh, I'm going to go first to uh, Lynn O. Churun Choi, uh, who is the head of Climate Strike Thailand, who has a question, I believe, for one of the other speakers. Uh, Lynn, I see you in the box there. We're listening. Hi there. Um, I've got a question for Andrew. Um, you hear me? I, um, so in regards to climate change, um, now we're seeing uh, all these carbon emissions and pollution rates drop, and, and we're seeing that we can do it if we choose to do it. But there's a lot of news going around that um, once our industries come back and then the economy restarts, what, what do you think would happen to our, our industries? Will they bounce back to, to compensate for all the losses and instead pollutions will, will double? or? Will governments and, and corporations be actually, will they actually emphasize the, the, the significance of nature and sustainability now? Lynn, thank you for that. Uh, uh, it's a tough question to predict the future. And mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting, if you go on Google, you can find maps showing comparisons between March last year and March this year for emissions. And you can see how much they've, uh, uh, gone down because we're not doing so much and I would like to think that we will learn a lesson from COVID-19 a lot of people say they want different lifestyles and uh, but you know um, if you look at what happens in the past uh, humans have short memories and we quickly get back to saying I want to go and see my friends I think a lot of people will say I what I need is a holiday and they're going to jump on planes and go to nice places and I fear that we will just simply go back 
to that uh, market-driven economy uh, because that's how businesses make money is by selling us things. What we've learned with COVID is that we don't need so much stuff. We're not going to the shops. We're not buying all kinds of fashions. Uh, we are having to buy food. But, you know, for example, in, in China, the car, new sales in cars has dropped by 86%. Well, that's terrible news if you're in the car industry. But it does make us think a bit, you know, do we really need all those cars? The reality is it's all about our own lifestyles. We have been brought into a consumer kind of culture, which is, has been very successful at raising standards of living uh, all around the world, but it produces a lot of emissions. So I hope that governments will uh, realize from this that there is another way and uh, be boldened by the fact that um, it's not so much our consumer lifestyles, it's the emissions they create. So if we can create energy without emissions, then we can use more of it. Uh, and they have to therefore create the conditions for the transfer away from fossil fuels and into new renewable sources of energy. That's what we need to do. If you think of product like palm oil, for instance, it's not palm oil that's really the problem, it's the, uh, which is uh, sold into China and Europe in vast quantities, traded around the world to make cakes and ice creams, cosmetics. We didn't use palm oil back in the 1950s. We used other kinds of vegetable oils. But palm oil is cheaper and produced faster. But the cost is cutting down rainforest land on which to grow the trees that produce the palm oil. It's not the palm oil that's the problem. It's the way it's grown. So we have to improve the way things are done. That's the big lesson here is whilst uh, we might say we shouldn't have a car or you shouldn't go on a holiday, in reality, I don't think human society evolves that way. And therefore, we have to make these things better. And one way to do that is to price them correctly. This is the key thing. We don't pay the true, true cost of things. If I buy chicken in a supermarket in the UK that's been fed on soy and transported from Thailand, the costs of bird flu that might have come as a result of poor management of the production of that chicken or the destruction of the rainforest caused by the soya production in Brazil, following on from cattle production, um, those kind of costs are not included in the true price of things. And these are what economists call externalities. If we included externalities in the prices of things, it changes what looks like a cheap product and what looks like an expensive product. And so that really uh, would really fundamentally change the way we buy and sell things across the world. And our consumer society would therefore favor sustainable products and would not favor unsustainable products because they look really expensive, whereas today they look cheap because they don't pay the true costs of damaging nature and our planet. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks, Lynn. Uh, Lynn Ocherunchai, one of the preeminent, I think, young environmental activists and journalists from Thailand. Really glad you were able to join us today, and thanks for bringing up the climate change angle to this. Uh, let's go to another question that's been uh, Facebooked in. Uh, Sean, I think this one is maybe for you. Is, Question is, how are we going to stop the use of these wildlife, these wild species, when they are, continue to be bred in captive breeding farms? Um, I think we return back to the issue that we're facing right now. Well, if trillions of dollars isn't enough, if billions of lives affected isn't enough, if millions of people sick and hundreds of thousands dying isn't enough, then I don't know, honestly. But this is an all of us issue again. And I think it becomes a matter of societal conscious, and I think it becomes a matter of global significance that we all play a hand in this. It comes down to, honestly, a number of layers. One is policy. Governments have to take a serious stand and treat this as they treat other massive issues, which is it's, this is a consequence that if we don't address, we're going to see a collapse on a level that we can't recover from next time. At the same time, we need to treat wildlife from a different perspective. You know, I'm looking around what's happening in the planet right now, and I want to sort of broaden the question slightly. I hear talk about nature is finally getting a chance to breathe. Yes, for a moment, in some ways, and maybe it's just the air, and particularly in countries where we commute a marathon every single day to work and we have 2.5 people owning two cars 
And the big concern is what am I having for dinner tonight, not if I'm having dinner for tonight. If we look around what's happening as a consequence that isn't even being measured, if we talk about externalities, right now it's a free for all in our natural parks. People don't have money, tourism jobs have evaporated overnight, stay at home, though is helping our health in the moment, is having a massive consequences. Marine protected areas are being emptied. Endangered species are being targeted in ways we've never imagined. Will this, so when we emerge and we go racing back to our fossil fuel addiction, which inevitably, unless things change, we will, instead of re-emerging into a more vibrant world, we're gonna have one where our most sacred places are, have been emptied. And the very trade that was the source of this issue, the wildlife trade and those markets is gonna be the one that empties it when we come out of this. So we have to think on a very significant broader perspective out of our little, well, you know, what are we dealing with right now in our little homes? And think about the fact that, yeah, maybe the air is a bit cleaner in some of these cities right now, but if we don't change what we're doing right now, yeah, we're gonna have a continued situation where animals are coming out of force albeit less, honestly, because they're going to be much less after this, I can tell you right now, if we don't do something about it, and that we're going to continue to move into breeding. And if we move that direction, all we've done is move the problem. We took it out of the forest where it belonged and it was healthy and natural and separated, and we moved it to even more concentrated areas. So I think it's about, is this enough? And I think the video I showed earlier, if we can't wake up from this situation, I don't have an answer for us. The governments have it within their hands right now to put an end to this, period. The solution lies right there. It's deciding as a global community, as soon as the doors open and the masks come off, do we race back to our cars? Do we fill our homes again as best we can with empty goods that basically disappear within a few months and go back into the landfills? Or do we look at the externalities, the cost of our living, look at the financial impact, not from a sense of, just our wallets, but what is it doing to the planet? And do we look at the situation of not just tomorrow, but move back to some of the ancient ways, which said, what is the generations ahead of us experience from our decisions today? And I would argue, I still have hope. I believe in the capacity of humans to change. I think we can come out of this and we can really change, but I think it is beholden to efforts like the one we're seeing today right here to remind us this is it, this is our wake up call because the next time it may not be a wake up call. The next time the death rate may be something like 40 or 60%. And then we're in a whole different world folks. So my ask is let's look to the less fortunate right now. Let's make sure that the solutions we come up with address the source, address the cause and drive meaningful lasting change instead of a blip on the radar as we race back to filling our homes with empty rubbish. Thanks, Sean. Very well put. Uh, you brought up a couple issues there. Philip Maruti from Africa Wildlife Foundation was going to chime in from Nairobi, but we had some technical difficulties. He was bringing up how, um, you know, uh, conservation <coughs> efforts in Africa are really hampered now because they depend on wildlife tourism, which is obviously down right now. And they also fear that people are going to try to resort to trade. We heard the question about breeding farms. You're saying that would just dip displace the problem. And you also brought up the fact that, uh, you know, if this isn't enough, what is? There are studies that show that health scares don't last, but I think this one may have some reverberations for a while because people have lost people. They've known people who are sick and everybody's lost money. We've had our lives disrupted. But by working together in an alliance, we got to stay strong because this can be exhausting for any one organization. So we're so glad to have you on board. We're also glad to have IBM on board. They also were going to chime in tonight. We know they're watching. Hello, IBM. Appreciate your support your, with the technology that you're giving us uh, for free to use in this alliance. Uh, okay, Alan Laubsch, we have a question for you. How do we make sure that stimulus programs only support businesses or investors that are good for the planet? Sure. Yeah. So, so the um, the the idea is that uh, there would be um, a, a proof of impact essentially, and that uh, we would pay for positive impact. Right. So right now, for example, there are very strict um, uh, standards around uh, carbon credits that are being rewarded for protecting forests, for example, or restoring mangroves. And uh, we have to make sure uh, that we look at um, the, uh, the, the, the entire picture, right? 
Um, and you know, of course, there are uh, there are cases, for example, in which um, carbon credits uh, have been uh, attempted to have been created uh, with very destructive activities, like um, destroying a healthy savanna and planting um, uh, rubber trees, for example, to get carbon credits. So there has to be uh, an oversight and control, and that's the idea around. Uh, the Earth Pulse is that uh, we would have a process of verifying what the impact is, uh, that we could look at the rainforest that's being protected, uh, the mangroves that are being planted. Um, the, uh, the overall idea as well, coming as a risk manager, um, is that uh, we have to look at what's important, right? So the, the real idea is to, to identify critical areas, the biological hotspots, right, that harbor all the uh, biodiversity that we need to protect. And, uh, and basically to, to focus on those. So for example, if you look at the global carbon cycle, just the coastal, marine coastal areas with mangroves, salt marshes, and uh, seagrass are super, super important. And we can see what the areas are that are the most threatened, right? So focus on, on the things that are the most important is essentially key. Having transparency around that uh, to be able to verify that. Um, and um, uh, essentially um, uh, enabling uh, enabling social intelligence to work as well, right? So not relying on very slow-moving bureaucracies, um, but actually using uh, the intelligence that we all have, for example, with our mobile phones. So there's a lot of ways in which we can gather intelligence. Um, just look at, uh, for example, how Airbnb was able to create ratings that people trust, right? So I think we can learn a lot from what companies like that have done uh, around verifying uh, that impacts are actually positive and regenerative. Thanks, Alan. Uh, now let's go to Juliana. Juliana, you still with us there? <laughs> yep, I see her. Juliana, question for you. What is the best way to address and promote behavior changes in a variety of cultures and markets that may be more challenged within populations to make these important changes? A tough question. Um, I think that the biggest driver of behavior change is what's happening now. Uh, I second what uh, uh, was it uh, Alan who said. Um, if this doesn't change, I don't know what it will. And also, we have to show people that um, we have given this industry excuses for too long, based on this is my cultural habit and this is a profitable industry. Profitable industry. Uh, COVID-19 is showing that this industry is not as profitable as it seems because it comes with a, a high cost. Uh, but also, uh, we have, as societies evolved, we have changed habits. We have let go of habits and of industries. So I think that a combination of loss, top-down approach, a combination of social reproval, a combination of uh, a choice that we are making uh, that this industry, this exploitation is not something that is positive for us, for, for our society. So here in Brazil, there is a strong, strong lobby and, and a huge uh, population who likes to own wild animals as pets. Um, why do you need to own a wild animal in the first place? Uh, is it, uh, isn't this cost high enough? So I think we need to educate, we need to bring information we need people to disapprove what people, what other people are doing. Uh, but also, yes, we need laws. We need to make choices as societies. We need political will. So it's a combination of top-down, bottom-up, and, and, and horizontal approaches. Thanks, Juliana. Uh, listen, folks, we have lots of other questions. But um, we're in Bangkok, and there is a curfew here. And if the camera crew, which has been organizing all this tonight, doesn't pack up on time, they can literally uh, get arrested on the way home. So we, we want to get them out of here safely. However, we have registered all of the ideas and questions here. The Alliance is going to take those on. We talk daily, multiple times. We do uh, Zoom calls as well, like this, but not with everybody else watching. But um, I want to basically remind the viewers and everybody out there that we have an alliance right now of 21 organizations. You're going to see at the end of this um, event, there's a slate up there that lists the different organizations that are members. We're looking for more organizations. We're looking for support from companies, from individuals. We're looking for different things. Yes, we're looking for funding. 
We want to put wind in the sails of the different projects. But we also are committed to knitting together our projects and learning from each other so we can be stronger together. We're looking for connections. We're looking for ideas. We're looking for hands. We're looking for, for feet as well. So you'll see at the end of this a list of the organizations and a website. You can go to that website. It'll tell you more about how, how to help. And I just want to thank uh, the Foreign Correspondence Club of Thailand also for hosting us here in Bangkok and a terrific crew from AsiaWorks, which has hooked up our Facebook Live, YouTube live streaming, uh, the live camera here, as well as the Zoom. Uh, I'm amazed that all this worked. Thank you so much, and um, we will see you next time. Thank you.